Hey, good morning, guys. Mr. Cavanaugh here. I hope everybody is doing well. Um, today, I want to go over some stuff on uh, World War II. Um, <laughs> not exactly how I had planned it, but, you know, this past month, nothing has really uh, gone to plan. But, you know, trying to cover World War II is such a significant event in world history uh, via video and note and video clips is not the way I wanted to do it. So my apologies. So hopefully, though, this will, some stuff we go over will spark uh, some interest for you to um, uh, to follow up uh, later on, maybe this summer or later in life. Is something that, that, you know, you gravitate towards that we've covered. Um, hopefully, you will uh, strike out on your own to research it further and find an interest in it, especially World War II. There's so much, uh, so many different stories that make up World War II. Um, it is just, it's just fascinating. Actually, we could spend all year uh, just on World War II. Uh, that's many of the topics we cover. As I've said before, um, you know, you go to certain universities and you can take a whole semester on the Civil War or a year on the Civil War. You can take a year on World War II or, or World War I or the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, you know, just these important, um, these important topics in uh, American and world history. Um, unfortunately for us in the situation we're in, we do not have the opportunity to delve in as deeply as I would like, but we will do the best that we can and uh, pick up some key information. Um, you know, another thing I, I want, we usually during this period of time, the study world, we watch Saving Private Ryan um, because it really depicts the theme of World War II which I want you to remember this and add this to your notes and know this. The theme of World War II for us, for the United States and other countries and individuals is sacrifice. It is about sacrifice. And World War II will be, for, especially for us, all about sacrifice. Um, everybody will have a role to play as we mobilize and go off to war. Everybody, man, woman, and child, um, have roles to play uh, during World War II. So remember that, sacrifice. And the movie Saving Private Ryan, if you haven't seen it before, it is all about sacrifice. Um, I don't want to give too much away about the movie because I still want you to watch it. Um, but it is about a group of individuals um, that are sent to find a young man by the name of Private Ryan, who um, the movie it deals with D-Day, Operation Overlord, and the invasion, the Allied invasion of Europe. Uh, the movie stars Tom Hanks. His character is Captain Miller. Um, he is with the Seventh Rangers, Ranger Battalion. Um, the night before the invasion, airborne troops they uh, they they parachute and drop behind enemy lines. And but they're all scattered all over the place and, and mist drops all over Normandy. Well, Ryan, something happens to his family, so he gets a ticket home. And Captain Miller and his men are sent to find Ryan um, and send him home. But when they find him, they're in a very unique situation. And Captain Miller has to make a decision on whether they're going to leave or stay and help Ryan and these other guys. I don't wanna to give too much of the movie away, but the movie is about sacrifice and something at the very end of the movie, what Captain Miller says to, to Private Ryan, he tells him to do something. And the whole movie is, it's really a theme for World War II. It's, it is about sacrifice. Um, I will tell you the movie, it's it's bloody, it, it, it's, it's war. It's not CYO camp. It is very bloody and a lot of language as well. Uh, soldiers have a very unique uh, vocabulary, very salty, if you will. Um, you know, I usually do permission slips for this, um, but since our situation, we're unable to do something like that, I'm just gonna hopefully, the permission slip that you used for um, 12 Years a Slave will be adequate um, because um, they're both of that, you know, the violence. So um, if you feel that you, you don't want to watch this because of the violence, um, that's fine. You don't have to watch it. If, if you're watching it and 
um, you feel like it is a little bit too much for you, that's okay. You don't need to watch it. No penalty. Uh, but but I, I would like you to watch it if you can. I did have a link to a service online uh, that you could watch it for free. And I looked at it again this morning and now I'm unable to get to it. So if you can, um, can you stream it yourselves um, via Netflix or some way online? or order it or rent it, but I would like you to watch Saving Private Ryan, uh, please. Um, I'll put something on your classroom feed about that, but um, you know, try to, try to get it in if you can. I mean, it is really the theme of World War II. Plus, plus it shows you the, the opening scene of the movie is intense. Um, it, it is the assault on the Normandy coastline by Allied forces. And it's, it's, it's violent, I will tell you. I will tell you it is violent and bloody. But it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty spot on. And when you watch it, imagine this actually happened. They did that. These young men did that. Um, and, and many were lost. So as you watch it, realize that that actually happened. Um... So let's 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 get in dig in a little bit quickly to World War II. Who's who? What's going on? Why does World War II happen? How's World War II different than World War One? You know, World War One will pretty much be confined to uh, the battlefields of Europe, the bulk of it. I mean, there's some fighting in other places, and you have the uh, the submarine warfare. Um, World War Two will be a global conflict on a global scale. Um, involving more countries, more individuals. So, so really, World War II is a true global conflict. So World War II, um, the world is going into a global depression, as we know. Uh, and many countries are, are searching for new leadership. In the United States, uh, we've elected a new president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, as the depression spreads around the world in parts of Europe, uh, countries are searching for new leadership as well. And we, we start to see the rise of new leaders in certain, in certain countries. Countries we're going to be focusing on um, in Europe right now are Italy and Germany. In Italy, uh, we see a new leader come to power, a gentleman by the name of Benito Mussolini. Um, El Duce, the leader in Italy. He moves his way up through power. Uh, he and his revolutionary fascist party, which fascism is a political ideological theory that's really starting to take hold in Europe. It's It's been around for a little bit, ebbs and flows, evolution. Uh, you ask 20 philosophers and political scientists to explain fascism, and you're going to get 20 different answers. But really, fascism is, is this ideology, uh, which is complex, of a government system with a deep sense of nationalism, uh, led by an individual who has absolute power, and using that power to suppress opposition by force. Let's just go with that regarding fascism. Um, so Mussolini comes to power using a type of fascism, um, to, to, to climb the political ladder, if you will, with his revolutionary fascist party. He's named prime minister uh, 1922 by King Victor Emmanuel. And then eventually, once in this power position, uh, Mussolini seizes absolute power of Italy. He, he becomes known as Il Duce, the leader. So we have Mussolini in Italy. Uh, over to Germany, Adolf Hitler is coming to power. Um, following Hitler, who's a World War I veteran, actually he's decorated with the Iron Cross, uh, but he is very upset and disillusioned by uh, Germany's surrender at the end of World War I. He is very upset, like many uh, World War I veterans in Germany. Um, Hitler, after the end of the war, Hitler joins the German Workers' Party, um, which eventually they changed their name to the uh, German our National Socialist German Workers' Party. We know it today really as better as the Nazi Party, the National Socialist German Workers Party, Nazi Party. Uh, the membership grows. 
Hitler rises up through the ranks. Um, you know, if you if you think about Hitler for a second, what do you think about? Most people think about his, his fiery oratory, his his speaking ability. Is he some like uh, you know shrinking violet up there, very quiet? No, he is up there uh, screaming at the top of his lungs, pounding his fist. You know how Germany will be great again, and I will lead the way. Um, that that's that's Hitler's style. People just people who are looking for leadership, especially as Germany uh, starts to sink into this depression. Uh, man, they're they're listening to this guy in the beer halls of Munich, and like, whoa, this guy, uh, this guy is awesome. Who is this guy? So Hitler grows in power, and his Nazi party begins to grow. Uh, Hitler and his Nazi party attempt to take over a uh, power surge of people in Munich, uh, but it is put down, and Hitler is arrested, and he's sent to prison. Um, while in prison, he writes uh, his. Uh, his memoir, if you will, Mein Kampf, My Struggle. Uh, he also uh, does a lot of painting. Hitler's, uh, actually some of his works are, are, are rather good. Um, oils, um, quite expensive today too. Not so much for their beauty, but who did the painting. Um, Hitler gets out of prison. He picks right back up where he left off with the Nazi party. But this time, instead of via force, he's going to I try to make the Nazi party a legitimate political party. Um, they have a seat in the Reichstag, which is the German parliament. And, and after election after election, the, the Nazi party grows in power within the Reichstag. Um, uh, 1933, the, the Nazi party is the largest in the Reichstag. Uh, President von Hindenburg uh, names uh, Adolf Hitler chancellor. Hindenburg dies, and then there's a suspicious fire at the Reichstag. The Reichstag burns down, which is the German parliament building. Hitler blames the communists and other organizations or political parties. And then Hitler says, I need all this absolute power because of these, these outside influences. So Hitler consolidates power um, all under himself and the Nazi party following the fire at the Reichstag. He assumes really new dictatorial powers. He's known now, he will, he will be known as Der Fuhrer, the leader uh, under this, this fascist ideology, which people are just gravitating towards him because he, he is going to make you know, Germany, um, he is going to bring the, the, you know, the greatness of Germany back and put people back to work, people looking for jobs. Uh, they're in the middle of the global depression. And Hitler will, will put people back to work as his popularity grows. Um, Hitler's preaching this new German identity, um, using anti-Semitism, the evils of the Jews, you know, propping up this enemy uh, for the German people to rally them. Um, you know, we're going to have Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. So... Hitler does a masterful job in doing this and drawing people to him. Um, he puts people back to work rebuilding the German war machine. Keep in mind, under the Treaty of Versailles, they, they're not allowed to have a large standing military, only some smaller small defense forces. But Hitler's like, whatever, I'm putting people back to work, and he does, rebuilding the German war machine, which is a clear violation of the Versailles Treaty. Allied powers know about this. England and France. Should England and France have come in and smacked Hitler around and stopped him before it evolved out of control? Well, they didn't because uh, they didn't want another war to ensue because the World War I had taken a lot out of them. So there are Mussolini and Hitler coming to power thanks to the current economic situations and people searching for new leadership. And these two flamboyant leaders rise to the top. Um, Hitler and Mussolini begin an alliance. Um, while that's going on, uh, the Soviet Union gets a new leader as well. Uh, Lenin dies, and Lenin is replaced by a gentleman by the name of Joseph Stalin. So Stalin is now the new leader in 1924 of the Soviet Union. Um, Hitler, the military is growing under Hitler. Hitler wants to test it out, naturally. So he wants to dip his toes in the water and see how far he can go and get away with. 
So Hitler moves German forces into what's called the Rhineland in 1936. Uh, the Rhineland is a demilitarized zone between uh, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. Um, the Allies do nothing. They, they chastise them. What are you doing? Oh, nothing. This is just territory. It's ours. We just need their people there. there. We need their to occupy it and, and assist these people. So, you know, the Allies are okay, but uh, don't go any further. I have a map on the notes to check it out. There's the Rhineland, and then 1938, the Sudetenland, which is an area of Czechoslovakia. Um, so in 1938, Hitler moves German forces into the Sudetenland, which is a border region between Germany and Czechoslovakia. Uh, there are German-speaking uh, people inhabiting in this area. Hitler says we need to go in there and assist these individuals. So he's moving military forces into these areas he's not supposed to be doing under the tenets of the Versailles Treaty. The Allies are getting a little worried um, British Prime Minister Chamberlain meets with Hitler um, says, hey, what are you doing? Hitler's like, look, hey, you know, um, nothing, we're just, you know, just, this is really German territory, German people. We need to help them. Uh, we need to support them and protect them. And the, the allies um, with Chamberlain as their representative are like, okay, but don't go any further uh, or we'll have to, you know, bad things may happen. So... Excuse me. Um, they have Hitler sign what's called the Munich Agreement. And then you get the famous photo, which I have in my notes here, of Chamberlain coming back to England. He's got a copy of the agreement in his hands, uh, giving an interview at the airport talking about peace in our time. You know, look, uh, this this guy, you know. And so they, what the Allies are doing, there's a word that comes out of this time period that becomes very important. It's called appeasement. The Allies start to appease Hitler. Um, they're letting him get away with little things. They're appeasing him. Okay, well, let him do this. Well, it's like, it's like a child. You let, you know, um, if you let this child do something continuously, they're going to keep doing it. And so the Allies, they, they think they have Hitler under control, but Hitler is faking them out. He has no intention of abiding by uh, the Munich Agreement. So Hitler is growing in power militarily. He's flexing his muscle a little bit. He's testing the waters. And Allied powers are really, uh, they're unwilling to take action at this time. Uh, World War I, again, took a lot out of them. And they're not looking to jump right back into a conflict. So Hitler is growing in power. And his, uh, his partnership with Mussolini, both of them are willing to start to flex their muscles. You start to see Italy moving into parts of North Africa. So while we're at home... Um, going through the Great Depression, trying to claw our way out of it through New Deal policies. In 1939, Hitler signs a non-aggression pact with the Soviets. Hey, we may want to take some other military action down the road, but don't worry, we have no, we have no ambition of uh, moving into the Soviet Union. And actually, if we move into Poland, how'd you like to come in from the other side and get a little property for yourself? Hmm. So 1939, uh, the Nazis signed non-aggression pact with the Soviets. And then on September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. World War II has commenced. And I have a map on the notes for you to view. Uh, Germany comes in from the West. Soviet Union comes into Poland from the East. Uh, the Germans, man, they, they just, the, the Nazis, utilizing what type of warfare, some of you know this, what type of warfare uh, did the, uh, the Germans make famous? Blitzkrieg tactics, lightning warfare, fast moving, airborne forces, air power, mechanized infantry. Uh, they just moved through Poland like a hot knife through butter. So the Germans attack or invade Poland. Under treaty obligations, September 3rd, 1939, Britain and France declare war on Germany. Uh, Britain and France, um, they have alliances with Poland and they go to war with Germany. This is all in Europe. There are gonna be two theaters of World War II, two theaters of operation. You're gonna have the European theater and then the Pacific theater. Ah. 
Um, so Germany's on the offensive. Uh, the next six weeks, they move through Belgium, Luxembourg. They bypass the Maginot Line going into France. They take France, the Netherlands. Uh, the British Army is pushed back um, to the French coast of Dunkirk, June 4th, 1944. Check out the movie Dunkirk. It's very good. Uh, the British Army is trapped on the beaches of Dunkirk, um, waiting to be annihilated as German forces swarm down on them. Um, there's some bad orders given in the German hierarchy, and the Germans order a halt to their attack on British forces at Dun trapped at Dunkirk. They could have wiped out the entire British army at Dunkirk, but the Germans drop the ball and they order a halt um, to get or to reorganize themselves. While this happens, um, Britain institutes a plan that they've had in place and they don't want to risk military ships losing them trying to get their guys off the beaches of France so they send over every vessel they can find all these different pleasure crafts and boats and ships and across the English Channel from England they pick up the British Army and spirit the army back to England in this fascinating story of saving the British Army from ruin on the beaches of Dunkirk. Uh, just, just everyday civilians. They get in their yachts, their sailboats, their pleasure crafts. They sail across the English Channel, pick up as many soldiers as they can, and they bring them back to England, saving the day for the British Army, allowing them to fight another day. While that's going on in Europe, backtrack a little bit in Asia, especially Japan. Japan has been going through ebbs and flows of revolutions, fights, many revolutions, uh, attempted coups, coups. Um, it's been a roller coaster in Japan. Japan wants to be a modern country. They want to be a world player. And we're going to focus on under the Emperor Hirohito and then his Prime Minister Tojo Hideki. They come to power and they want Japan to be a modern world power. But there's one thing that they are lacking to do this, and that is natural resources. They do not have enough natural resources to achieve this goal. So they invade China um, to gobble up natural resources in China and other parts of Southeast Asia, especially petroleum and rubber. Um, so Japan invades China, 1937. I have a map on your notes, check that out. So Japan now is growing in power. And eventually, uh, Germany, Italy, and Japan will align themselves. This becomes known as the Tripartite Pact. Remember that, Tripartite Pact. Back in England, Chamberlain is out. He, he misread Germany, and he gets a no-confidence vote in Parliament. So Neville Chamberlain is out as Prime Minister, and England brings in... Winston Churchill, the Bulldog. 1940, Winston Churchill is the new Prime Minister of Great Britain. So you have FDR for the United States, you have Churchill uh, for uh, the new British Prime Minister, and you have Joseph Stalin, the head of the Soviet Union. Remember those names, remember those countries. As the war begins, America remains isolated. We do support uh, our allies, England, through cash and carry and lend lease programs, providing them with military assistance um, as Germany advances across Europe and parts of North Africa. Japan is on the move as well. Um, we believe that Japan has militaristic um, goals of attacking the Philippines, which we are controlling at the time. Remember, go back to the Spanish-American War. That's when we take control of the Philippines. And we are controlling the Philippines, if you will. And we believe that Japan has interests on moving on the Philippines. So for, to protect ourselves, FDR brings our Pacific Fleet, which is headquartered out of San Diego, California. And we move the bulk of our Pacific Fleet to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, to be in striking distance 
in case the Japanese attack the Philippines. Well, the Japanese, they're not going to attack the Philippines. Um, they're going to throw us a head fake. So Japan knows that to gain control of parts of Asia and the Pacific, we're the only thing in their way. And they need to get rid of us or cripple us if they want to gain control of vast swaths of the Pacific. We're the only thing standing in their way. So the J Japanese do not attack the Philippines yet. They bypass the Philippines and they're going to attack our fleet at Pearl Harbor. So a plan is devised by Admiral Yamamoto and put into place. They will steam an armada as close to Pearl Harbor or Hawaii as they can and launch varying waves of fighter bombers and submarine planes to inflict damage on our fleet at Pearl Harbor. I have maps on the notes um, that you can look over. So it's early Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941. Um, it's, you know, we, we're not expecting an attack at all or something's gonna happen in the Philippines, not, you know, not at Pearl Harbor. So we're very unprepared for the attack as it inf unfolds. I've put different maps on the notes, as well as different uh, visualization of the Japanese ships. So different waves of the attack. Uh, the first wave comes around 7.40 a.m. Uh, the next wave comes about an hour later at 8.40 a.m. Different pictures of the attack taking place. And then a picture of the USS Arizona Memorial. Uh, losses for us, battleships are taken out. We, we suffer heavy casualties, uh, loss of battleships, as well as other vessels. Um, it's, it's just horrific for us. As the word goes out across the country and around the world, that um, Hawaii has been attacked, America has been attacked, um, our fleet has been has been crippled at Pearl Harbor. We are lucky though, uh, because our aircraft carriers are not in port, they are out to sea. So we do dodge a small bullet there, but it is devastating to us. The next day, FDR, goes to the Joint Session of Congress, December 8, 1941, um, where he gives his famous uh, speech, and the famous line of the speech, uh, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, which he kind of inserted at the very end. Many of, many of his advisors wanted him to give this long, flowing speech, but FDR said, no, it needs to be short and to the point and focus, and that's the speech he gave. Actually, a quick sidebar, FDR talked about, he wasn't worried about the speech. He knew the speech was good uh, to, to rally America to the cause, which we would, we would declare war on Japan, and then Germany and Italy would turn around and declare war on us. Um, you know, FDR was, was crippled by polio, and he said the, the, the one thing he was worried about was having to, to walk up, and you know, he's in the house chamber, and he has to walk up this long aisle um, uh, up to the podium, if you will. And he said he was so worried about making that walk and stumbling and falling because he had to walk with the braces on. He had his uh, arm interlocked inside his son's arm. Um, his son, who was one of his aides, a military officer, he had a cane in the other hand. So he was kind of like just throwing his legs in front of him to walk up there. And he was so worried about falling because he felt that would send such a visualization, such a message of weakness that the United States was was weak and so he said that that's what he was really worried about was being able to walk up there which he did he gives this iconic speech December 7 1941 which I'll put a video clip of this on your uh, uh, classroom feed um, and then we, we, we are going to war but now we need to mobilize we're, we're not ready for war we're in the midst of a depression we are not ready uh, for war. So we need to mobilize. Young men are running uh, to uh, the recruitment centers to sign up right away. Uh, people rally, especially young men, 
and they're going to go off to war and do their part right away. Um, Japan would, uh, Japan now turns uh, to the Philippines and other islands of the Pacific. They move on the Philippines now. The Philippines is going to fall. General MacArthur is forced to flee and they start gobbling up other islands in the Pacific, island hopping. And then while that's happening, Germany breaks its non-aggression pact with the Soviets and invades the Soviet Union. So now the war is erupting. It is evolving. It is, it is turning into a true world war. Um, I know this is a pretty long video. My apologies, but there's a lot to unpack. Uh, you know, every, to me, everything is important. We gotta cover everything. Um, so I'll put the notes and I'll put this video on your classroom feed along with some other stuff. I remember, dig up Saving Private Ryan, uh, but you're not required to watch it. I recommend, I do want you to watch it. It really depicts the theme of World War II for us, and that is sacrifice. Get back to me if you have any questions. Kavanaugh out.